Today, I'm showing you how to make a prickly pear mead at home. So let's get started. So what is a prickly pear? Some of you might already know this, some of you might not. A prickly pear comes from, it's like an offshoot of the cactus. It's commonly referred to as a cactus pear or Indian fig. The prickly pear is a fruit producing cactus belonging to some genus there. It's native to Mexico. So the fruit comes in lots of different colors, but notably you'll see it in like a pink purpley kind of color that's pretty cool. They're kind of tough to pick, but they're really good. And the descriptive taste that I'm seeing here and that I, ex I have also agreed with, I'll say, is that it tastes like melon or kiwi, sometimes a hint of bubble gum. I don't really get that, that's what this says. So anyways, kind of hard for me to get here in Oklahoma, but I found an alternative to this prickly pear dilemma. In this video, I'm showing you how to make a prickly pear mead with a syrup. Now, if you have them local to you, awesome, go buy them. I don't have the luxury, so if you can get a hold of the fruit, we're gonna talk about the differences between a, a fruited version of this and maybe a syrup or a concentrate version, but today's recipes that I'm promoting right now are with a syrup. So before you go in the comments and say, well, you didn't really make a prickly pear mead, um, you're probably right, I didn't use the actual fruit, but that doesn't mean that this is not still prickly pear tasting. So today I am showing you how to make a prickly pear mead in a bottle carbonated version, because this is about a six and a half percent carbonated mead. So this is a bottle carbonated version. And this is a kegged version, which I'll also show you how to make. You could make this higher strength, standard strength, or whatever you want to do. But most importantly, get a hold of either the syrup or prickly pears themselves. So I'm going to show you two recipe cards, and I'll walk you through each one. We're going to start with the bottle carbonated version. The bottle carbonated version uses some priming sugar, some non-fermentable sugar in the latter half of it so that you can have sweetness and then bottle carbonate. And the uh, kegged version uses some honey because it's been stabilized in the syrup. This is Monin syrup. You can buy any other kind. This was probably like 20 bucks for this, uh, I don't know how many ounce, 33 ounces of this. And I have made now nine gallons of mead and I still have some left so you can get a lot of mead with the syrup. So let's get started. Both the bottle carbonated and the kegged version start in the same fashion. In this video, you're gonna see me making a really big version of this, a five gallon version, but really my recipes are for one gallons. So if you wanna do this, you can scale up to the five if you wanna follow exactly what I did. Otherwise, it's, there's a one gallon recipe. So we're gonna make a traditional mead to start. Traditional mead is honey, water, and yeast. We're using orange blossom honey in this circumstance, but I would use any other light honey you can get, clover, wildflower, stuff like that. I would not use a buckwheat or a avocado blossom or something dark. We're gonna use the first half of our recipe card. So we're using our Fermade O, of course, to give us nutrient. We're using about one and a half pounds per gallon of honey, water up to a gallon. Then we're gonna add the Lavin K1V1116 or any other yeast like that to this brew. We're gonna front load our nutrients, meaning we're gonna add all of that Fermade O when we start the brew because it's just easier and less maintenance for me. So once we've mixed all of those things together, we're literally just gonna let it set and ferment for like two to three weeks. Mine took about two weeks to ferment. So again, we've, we've started both of these now. We've started the kegged and the bottle carved. It's the same process. So there's that traditional mead to begin let it ferment out for two weeks, two to three weeks. You'll see the yeast start to fall to the bottom. You'll see it maybe clear up a little bit, maybe not. Once we notice that the fermentation has slowed down and our traditional mead has gone from our starting gravity, which I forgot to mention is 1.055 or about 1.050, somewhere in that range. Once it lands at about 1.000, which it will, you're gonna go ahead and start the fork. <laughs> Here's the fork in the road of, Bottle carbonated goes this way, kegged goes this way. So we started here, it's all the same. Beginning of the kegged, bottle carbed, now here we go. So let's go to the bottle carbed route first. 
We want to keep yeast in this brew because they are gonna do some work for us when it comes to actually taking and giving us carbonation in the bottle. So we're gonna go ahead and move our bottle carbonated version into a new container. We're gonna try and keep a little bit of yeast because it's important to keep some yeast in there so that they will continue to do what they need to do. Once we've racked it into a new container with an auto siphon and tubing or however you wanna do it, you can add some of your flavoring. Now here's where it gets a little bit weird. Depending on how strong of a prickly pear taste you want, you can add more or less syrup. So this is, in my thing I use like a range, I think it's two to four or maybe two to five ounces. Two would be lighter prickly pear, five would be more. Regardless of how much you add, you're gonna go ahead and add the prickly pear syrup into the container. So your bottle carbonated version is going to have a re-fermentation side, a secondary fermentation. Meaning that the yeast are gonna take all the sugars that are in here, because there are sugars in here, and go ahead and start fermenting again. And that is okay. Could you just throw the prickly pear syrup in the beginning? Of course. My big issue with this is that you might lose more flavor from the prickly pear because of a vigorous fermentation where it's really bubbling. So the secondary fermentation side loses less flavoring because it's not as vigorous. So we add our prickly pear syrup, we let it ferment again. It's going through secondary fermentation. It might take another two weeks for it to completely all finish up. Things will start to settle at the bottom again. At this point, we go ahead and rack it again into a new container to get off any sludge or sediment. Still minding to keep a little bit of yeast in there. We are now going to take and add our erythritol or any non-fermentable sugar. We're using erythritol in this circumstance. You add it in there. I use between six and 12 ounces of erythritol depending on how sweet you want it to go. The prickly pear side has been fermented on, so that sweetness will help. We also add priming sugar. It could be in the form of corn sugar, molasses, table sugar, any of the possible ones you can use that are fermentable. I used a calculator to figure out how much to add. So we're adding 0.5 ounces of corn sugar in with our erythritol in this container. We are then going to stir all of that up, make sure it's all blended together and bottle this. We go ahead and put them all in bottles. And what happens here is because there's yeast still present in the brew that can still go, we are now looking at bottle carbonation happening because the yeast are gonna be in there. They're gonna consume the corn sugar or the priming sugar, which will then turn into carbonation because as they consume them, they produce the CO2 and that CO2 stays in the bottle, hence carbonation. Two weeks goes by and you'll have yourself, two or three probably, you'll have yourself a carbonated <laughs> prickly pear mead in the bottle. All right, so we're gonna come back to this guy. We'll pour him in a second, but that's the bottle carb version. Been setting for a while. Next up, we have the kegged version. So we go backwards in our time. We go back to the fork. We finished our primary fermentation. We're now gonna move the kegged version into a new container and because we don't need the yeast anymore and we wanna retain as much sweetness as we can from honey and prickly pear syrup, we're actually gonna go ahead and stabilize or pasteurize this thing. I used potassium sorbate and potassium metabisulfite in the bucket as I was racking it over. This halts any further fermentation, allowing me to get sweetness from fermentable sugars. You can also uh, pasteurize the brew if you want to do that. It's a heating up process where you heat the liquid to a certain degree for a certain amount of time and it kills off the yeast. Once we've stabilized this, we'll wait about 24 to 48 hours just to make sure the stabilizers do their thing or the pasteurizing does its thing. And we can go ahead and add our syrup. We're gonna add between two and five ounces depending on you know, how prickly pear-y we want this to be. We mix that in, it changes the color. It looks like a beautiful different color. It's really fun. And then we can go ahead and back sweeten this brew. So we're gonna back sweeten with honey specifically because we wanna pronounce honey character. It's not gonna go through any more fermentation because we've stabilized this thing. So we back sweeten with about a half a pound of honey. And I use a light honey again, our prickly pear syrup. And then if you wanna make any adjustments to acid balance, meaning if it's not, doesn't have enough bite acidity, in both of these bottle 
uh, side or keg side, you can use like citric acid or maybe malic acid. Just a little pinch of it in there will help to bring up acidity. That's an alternative thing you don't have to do. It's kind of next level. As a beginner recipe, keep it simple. We then move it into the keg. This is a 1.3 gallon keg. You can use just a regular one gallon keg. I'll have links below, by the way, to some things. Or if you have a bigger setup, five gallon keg, do that. We're gonna force carbonate this. This it uses a CO2 cartridge, which you just kind of bump up the regulator to 30 PSI for about two to three days. You put it in a cold place, so this was in a fridge for a while, which helped it carbonate faster. And after two or three days at 30 PSI, we bump the PSI back down to about three to five for serving, and we have ourselves a carbonated brew. Force carbonated, I should say. Prickly pear, force carb. Prickly pear, bottle carved. Both are achievable at home, and I encourage you to try it. Let's go ahead and pour them and see what they taste like. All right, so keg carved on my left, bottle carved on my right. Bottle carb is not super carbonated. I might have gone a little too low with my priming sugar. It has been three weeks, so theoretically this should have bottle carbed fully. Anyways, let's go ahead and taste them. You can see the color is pretty nice. I really like the color. It's the same on both sides. We're gonna go ahead and taste the bottle carbed first. First. A little more petalant than fully carbonated, but there is some carbonation there. What's fun is the prickly pear syrup side has stayed through even post carbonation. It's really refreshing. It does have a more warm, mellow flavor character in this circumstance. It's very smooth. I mean, we're above six and a half percent now because of that extra fermentation and the priming sugar. So this has gone a little bit past that point, but as a seven percent ish mead, bottle carved is super fast and pretty dang good. I I'm a big fan of this. I wish I'd added maybe a little more priming sugar, but it's okay. So now we flip over to the kegged side. Yeah, so this one, because it didn't have any fermentation on the prickly pear side, is a little brighter in my opinion. It has more brightness, more apparent and floral because of the honey, but the fruit itself can shine in a brighter manner. It's really smooth. This one's more carbonated. Honestly, it's really good. And the brightness helps bring out more of the prickly pear note there. Both of these are fantastic. I had the opportunity to taste a true, prick, I'll say true, prickly pear mead that used the actual fruit themselves when I was hanging out with the Fox and Raven crew, which I'll put some links for them below. They're a meadery in Texas. And um, we went down there, BC and, and myself, and we sat down, I brought my prickly pear version with the syrup, and he brought out his prickly pear mead, which actually had prickly pears in it, and we tasted them. So let's talk about the differences real fast. So um, <laughs> this is Bryce, he has also made a prickly pear mead. Yes. And by, by chance, by fate, whatever the term is here, um, we are going to taste these together. Yeah. This is my version, which I'm not gonna tell you anything about until we finish. Okay. Because I think you'll be mad at me. I already read online, so. <laughs> you read it online? Yeah, you commented oh, on it. Dang it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you used the flavoring. Don't be too mad at me. Yeah, no, I won't. I'm actually, I'm really curious to see the difference. Well, let's so. start with, with mine, because okay. I think we'll end with yours, which is going to be better, probably. Cool. Using well, the we'll real see, thing. We'll see. Use the real thing. That's yeah. the spoiler here. <laughs> okay, so here's right. mine. This is a keg carbonated version. Okay. Okay. I mean, you, you definitely, need? you get the prickly pear flavor, but like it's not as full as the real one, but it's definitely, it's there. Mm -hmm. It's definitely noticeable as prickly pear. And the sweetness is actually really good. Like it's not overly sweet. Yeah. And if memory serves, I think you said you sweetened it to 1030. 1030 ish. Yeah. yeah. Somewhere yeah, in yeah. It's on flavoring, obviously not ever going to be the same as the real thing, which no. just makes me curious what the real thing yeah. is like. I've never had, I would say the real thing. All right. Ready? Yeah. Switching over to the real thing. That is very different. That is much more bright. Yeah, it's more bright. You get a little bit more of that funkiness to it. Mm -hmm. um, I did add a little bit more acid to it as well, just to kind of give it a little bit more of a pop. But, uh, and this one is actually less sweet at 1022. Yeah. But they feel about the same. They do. 
you, just that acid, I think there brightens it up a little bit too. Mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to describe the differences and my brain so is not. The, the real fruit is definitely more fresh. Yeah. Uh, you definitely get more of the fruit flavor, whereas in the um, flavoring, it seems a little dull by comparison. Mm. But that being said, it's still good. Yeah, I would still drink the, the F out of this. Like, this is good. But like, also just look at the color difference though, <laughs> yeah. you know? <laughs> like, the coloring, got, the, the flavor itself, I'm sure if I dumped more in it, it would be the same color, but yeah. I just, obviously there's a point where you have to stop dumping flavoring in. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> You there could is. keep going. <laughs> no, I agree though. I think that that brightness from the fruit, it, it is fresh. I mean, I feel like that's the word I was looking for, <laughs> is it's just making it more fresh tasting. Mm -hmm more of an actual fruit. Not to say this doesn't taste like actual fruit, but it's more mellow. It's yeah. definitely less and acidic. The smell of it, like, mm. honestly, I can't, in, the, in the, the flavoring one, I can't really make the smell of prickly pear out, like, mm -hmm. pretty much at all. It just kind of is just kind of yeah. a blank canvas. Whereas in this one, you definitely get that, like, little bit of funkiness that the mm -hmm. prickly pear gives, and then kind of a little fruity flavor in there. Yeah. Or smell, I should say. This makes me want to work with real Prickly pear, and Dude, I actually do it on a real way, but. It, it, prickly pears, they're my favorite fruit to work with, especially for mead. Um, they're just around for such a short time out of the year. It's like yeah. six to eight weeks tops that it's yeah. around, and then that's it. Well, I feel so, inspired now to go ahead right? and try it. That's so curious <laughs> now. Um, so, if you wanna check out Fox and Raven Mead, they make a lot of mead, and they're in Texas, in Carrollton, Texas, mm -hmm. if you're local to here specifically, but also they can, um, do you guys ship? Yeah, 38 different states right now. Okay, so they're with links below. Go ahead and support them, buy some mead. We've been tasting it some tonight and it is fantastic. Yeah. Can confirm, BC can confirm, right? It's great. There you go. <laughs> BC's behind the camera, so. <laughs> thanks for uh, being a part of this. Yeah, tasting. thanks for coming out, man. This is good, fun experiment. Well, <laughs> we'll see you in the uh, bottle conditioned tasting. So as you can see, his was a little brighter and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that his necessarily was um, a different prickly pear itself. It just was a, a truer fruited side. There is a syrupy note. There is a note of uh, warm sugary more so than the bright side. I personally really liked his and um, I think he liked elements of mine, but I liked his a lot too. So if you wanna do this in a way that uses the real fruit, I am not saying no. In fact, I'm saying go for it. I just don't have access to that. What's cool about this is the process we just went through with the prickly pear syrup specifically could be subbed out for any other syrup at, you know, in the world. If you have another flavor profile, another syrup you can get a hold of, you can just sub out that specific syrup for this one. So while mine is maybe not as, uh, I'm again, say true prickly pear-y, it still has the elements there. For me, as somebody who doesn't get the opportunity to try prickly pear very often, if at all, this is a really good thing for me. Maybe you have friends who've never tried prickly pear. This is a great chance to show them what's going on. It's super easy and super fun. And you can do it either way, bottle, carbonated, or kegged. So if you are interested in the keg side, there are some links to some kegs below. They are affiliate links, which means you don't spend any more money, but the money you do spend, a little chunk of it comes back to support the channel. So please use those links if you're interested. If you wanna just do it the bottle carved way, of course there's that. I have tried my best to make this as approachable as possible. So here are two timelines for how to make this mead and what it looks like. You can see them on screen and hopefully it makes it more approachable for you. So again, recipe cards are around there and the timeline. I'd be very curious to see if you make this or maybe a different version with a different syrup or let me know what you think below. But I've had a lot of fun making this and I hope that you'll join me for more meads in the future. I've actually done a root beer mead in a very similar fashion, not with syrup necessarily, but with a um, extract of sorts and it was really good. So I hope you go check that out. Check out the other videos on the channel. We're on the road to 75,000 subscribers by the end of 2024. So let's get there with your help. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Cheers.